All right, today we're gonna do a show on little tiny restaurants that are like, you know, kind of like the hole in the wall theory. A lot of these places do great value, great food, a lot of talent in New York in little restaurants. We're gonna start here at Chiquito, which means little in Basque dialect. Um, Alex and Raj, husband and wife, you know them from Tiapol. They are, do some of the best tapas in town, have been for years. This is tapas with a very Basque style. Really interesting, great food. Let's come inside and meet them. Chiquito, great name. You'll see why they call it that in about two seconds. Okay, here we go, chanquetes, chulda y solomo ravioli, pulpo, croqueta, mendaico. Slow, croqueta, pulpo, ravioli. It's pork ribs in cilindron sauce, which is made of mostly red and green pepper. And just like slow braised? Yeah. Chiquito means small, so we're still working small or growing small. This is sort of our, sort of, uh, um, it's our preference. First of all, being Basque, being born in Bilbao, one of the Basque cities, the capital of the, of the Basque country, and also having so much background, the Basque people are so like into food, and it was like and they, like so respectful through through the food too. What's the sauce made from? Chimichurri, parsley oil, and dry oregano, and chili flakes, and this is the suckling pig. I'm particularly fond of Basque food. Especially in this country, like everywhere else in the world, Basque food is synonymous with quality, but here people don't really know about Basque food. The Basque country is located in between like really high mountains, so the water draws from the mountains, so the land is really green, a lot of vegetables, a lot of like like cows and pigs and stuff, so that, and the sea is right there. It's like the sea starts, there's a little bit of land and the mountains go ahead, so, and it rains a lot. It's like kind of the Seattle weather, so we have pretty much everything. You have the sea, you have the good land, you have like, and that was like, why the bus is like so about products. So we really much is like don't do nothing to the product. It's like get the best you can get. And don't get in the way. Exactly, and don't do much about it. Can you describe to me what's going on, Chef? Tell me what you're making here. I'm making the Salomo, um, searing the piquillo peppers right after that, right now. It's just real thin pork loin that's been marinated in. In uh, paprika, garlic, and salt. That's pretty. Tell me about this space, because it's this little, tiny, I mean, it's a little, this is funny, little one-story buildings. You have uh, Jim Leahy, you've got some great culinary neighbors now. Jim Leahy's got Co a couple of doors down, but dry cleaner, pastry shop, it's this funny little strip of Chelsea. I love this. I moved out here from Seattle, where like all the best ethnic restaurants were in strip malls, so like, I feel like we have, I mean, there's only like three strip malls in all of Manhattan that I know of, and, and I, you know, I would love one, a space in every single one of them. All right, we're here inside Little Giant with Julie Harris Lock. Thanks for having us, first of all. Thank you for coming in. Um, you know, so this show's about little tiny places that are cool. You're not that tiny. I mean, it's, you got 32 seats and some we're, outside. We're 32, so in the winter we're tidier than we are in the summer. We have this lovely sidewalk that we can seat 12 on in, but the, in the summer. Don't let the seats fool you. You haven't seen anything yet. You guys get like the award for maybe Ghetto Kitchen of the Year. <laughs> I knew you were small, and I, when I've eaten here, I've never been, I'm always loath to sort of poke around, you know, and introduce, so I would just eat and leave and pay the bill. And and I always could That's see you guys. That's a good customer. Yeah, good customer, yeah, most of the time. It's negotiable. And, and I could see the two of you moving around back there. And, you know, I don't know, it didn't look like much space, but it's just the way I looked, I mean, there's nothing. It's, it's uh, the little engine that could kitchen. So talk about the food, because you're like, I mean, I hate this, I, I hate giving, describing, what is this, new America, it's like, market driven. American, market. Thank you, thank you, thank you. But I mean, the truth is, you will have, you have the flexibility to, I mean, you are shopping every day, you are market driven, but you, you describe it, because it's, it's yours. It's really sort of the type of cooking that you would get at home. I grew up in the Midwest. Um, my grandparents are German and Polish, and my mom's side is French Canadian, and we were very big proponents of the family supper, and Sunday suppers, and I had dinner with my family every, every 
day of the week. And it was this really nice environment to grow up in. And so we wanted to sort of create this environment where people felt like they were at home. And they were serving sort of refined you know, versions of, of comfort food. And coming from you know, a background that I had at Blue Hill and the respect for ingredients and quality ingredients. And we said, well, we can't really do that much to the ingredients because we're in this really small kitchen and right. the small environment. So let's just do justice to them and make them shine. Yeah, don't get, go, get good stuff, don't get in the way. Exactly. So we do really simple, clean flavors, uh, a nice balance of flavors, hearty portions. Mac so this is the mac and cheese. Uh, we make a larger portion that we like to call a heart attack on a plate, which is served in a really big skillet. Uh, but this is the side dish, which is a pretty generous side dish. It's made with Raffetto's cavatelli, fresh cavatelli um, from Raffetto's in Soho. Um, the cream sauce is made with aged Grafton cheddar and grana padana, and some onions and thyme and rosemary. And reduced heavy cream. And reduced heavy cream. Yeah. Plus, apple Plus with... the apple is fed bacon. Because well, everything's better with bacon. No, and it needed it. It badly needed it. This is ridiculous. Hold on, I'm going in. Hold on. Incoming. Incoming. So I think I scared that girl. Uh, braised with bacon and white wine and caraway and uh, cork dumplings. It's a pork sausage that's uh, flavored with a lot of pepper and marjoram. We're here at Cafe Caccia, this little tiny, this is the show we're doing a little tiny holes in the wall, for want of a better term. I think you fit the This bill. is one for sure. Yeah, you've got <laughs> wait, wait, 16 feet, well, this is like a tea hole that shrunk. This is Maybe. 10 feet actually right here. That's it. Yeah. So It widens up a little in back. How, how did you get in this business in this spot? Give me the back story. In this very spot? Yeah. Okay, here's the deal. Now, I'm 50% of this space. My partner, Irvin Schrotner, is, uh, he's someone who's, I mean, we're great friends and we also worked together for about eight years before we started this space. So um, the, I live in this neighborhood. This space came up for rent, mm -hmm. and I said, "Hey, Irwin, let's let's take that space. Let's do something." So we said, "Okay, well, uh, let's take it. Let's we're going to do a little bar, and we'll have some little food and stuff." And Irwin said, "Hey, let's do Austrian food." So I said, "Yeah, that sounds good. You know, I mean, uh, there's not much Austrian food around, Kurt, and that's it. It's yeah, I don't want to say, and that's, that's it, true. but that's it's pretty bit. darn close yeah. to that." And, um, you know, like we, we wanted to have a place where people could have good beer and a, you know, glass of wine and a little bite to eat. And the other thing besides making an Austrian place was making it, actually the, the first thing was to make it a neighborhood place, you know, which meant to us a place that you wouldn't have to think very hard about going to if you wanted to go out for something. So that means, you know, not expensive, friendly and you know good good food and drink so this is going to be the pork belly so that's uh, sauerkraut that's been braised with a lot of uh, onions a little bit of garlic and uh, a lot of bacon and caraway we do a big spice sachet in there and then um, and then it's braised for quite a long time you can see it got translucent now you know and um, those are uh, quark dumplings. I mean, quark is like the Germanic counterpart to fromage blanc. Right. So that's like a dumpling that you would see in Alsace or somewhere like that, like a fromage blanc canals or something. Try a you know, Americans, yeah, the, you know, a lot of Americans don't have passports. Luckily, we're in New York, a lot of people travel. <laughs> exactly. But still, a lot, you know, Americans go predictably London, Paris, Rome, right. Spain these days, Switzerland a bit. Austria is a little out of the way. Talk about Austrian cuisine, because we know it's sort of that it has some Germanic influence. Right. But talk a bit about what would we be finding in typical cafes, typical restaurants okay, throughout uh, Austria. Austrian, uh, first thing you uh, think of Vienna first. And it uh, definitely has the sweet st stuff yeah. that you need pastry. So there's already a, a point to go. But then um, in the mind, it's still Austria has the heavier food like goulash, a lot of stews and uh, uh, dumplings. Uh, what is true, but uh, also uh, uh, has great salads and uh, 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 refreshing dishes. And the Austrian cuisine came a long way. Of course, we are not very flexible with uh, uh, fish and stuff like this, because as you know, we're in the mountains, yeah. a few brook trouts or a carp uh, uh, or a pike, that's as far as goes. 
but um, we do integrate a lot of uh, uh, those local fishes and so the food is uh, definitely uh, uh, getting lighter and lighter and away from the stews. Similar like a, a, a gnocchi but we hand roll them a little bit longer and uh, just dress them with uh, lots of butter, <laughs> breadcrumbs and cinnamon and sugar and the apricots go really good also a plum would be a roasted plum would go very well with it. What is really good with it is um, the perfect schnapps, apricot, apricot schnapps. All right, uh, I can't say no. Do I have to twist your arms? No, no. It's, it's twisted, it's, I give up. So on the North Street, they don't drink alone, so I have to drink one with you. <laughs> it's a good tradition. Prost! Yeah, the apricot comes really good, and it goes really good with the Schupfnudel. I'm in. Yeah. I'm in. All right, so we did this piece on great little restaurants that I love around town. Um, Chiquito's great with Alex and uh, Ader. Uh, I love Little Giant, Cafe Caccia. You know, all these places are great because they're chef driven, the chefs are in the kitchen, the chefs still like what they're doing, and they still cook. You know, isn't that a novelty? Well, more and more it is. Um, so I'm just going to do something real simple, not based on anything specific that we saw. Um, pork's kind of one of these great, inexpensive, delicious meats. I'm going to buy a nice, simple pork chop. We're going to do a real simple mashed potato. We're going to use a Yukon Gold that we're going to do kind of simply. We're going to peel it and just simmer it with a little milk, no heavy cream. You'll see how simple this is to do. It's low fat, it's delicious, salt, pepper, um, and asparagus is in season. So we're, we're still spraying going into summer. So protein, starch, vegetable, one-stop shopping kind of like the kind of cooking they do in those little places. So let's talk with Richie Quinn. We're going to talk a little bit about the meat here. I'm not cooking your steaks, but I got to tell you, that is some beautiful looking meat. This is U.S. prime dry aged? This is U.S. prime aged. I mean, that's just, that's ridiculously good marble for supermarket meat. Yeah, we bring in some of the top quality meat in the city. Uh, we're real fortunate. Um, often, what comes in is exactly what we want. If it's not what we want, we send it back. But we're real, pick, real picky about what we bring into, you know, into food accordingly. And I'm really picky about what I buy. And I got to tell you, I mean, I, that when I see that meat at other places elsewhere in town, you can almost double the price tag. That's beautiful. That's a beautiful steak. As is the uh, the rib steak. That was a nice carcass. That's yeah. seriously nice prime meat. Well, in our business, eye appeal is buy appeal. And in this uh, particular case, you're telling me that. That meat says buy me. Uh, it's what it says to me. Yeah, fat means flavor. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna just, you're gonna cut me a, a pork chop. Sure. We're gonna throw it in the bag. Sure. When I go back to the studio, that's the pork chop we'll cook it for the show. Fair enough. Thank you, brother. Okay, my pleasure. So we did some shopping. Pork, man. Uh, yeah, who doesn't like pork? Pork's like this wonderful. Um, pork's probably like the chef's favorite meat of the last couple of years. I mean, everybody's been doing pork belly, brined pork chops. A lot of it has to do with the fact that we've got, we're getting great pork now in America. Um, it's moving a little away, at least on the restaurant side, from the commodity, you know, big, cheap, fast, miserable animals, tastes like nothing pork that had no fat at all. And we're going back in time to heritage breeds, single breeds, Berkshire, Hampshire, Duroc, Red Wattle, these wonderful, wonderful old American British, Irish, German breeds that are living full lives, eating what they're supposed to eat, you know, humanely slaughtered, meat tastes great. So this is a really pretty pork chop. We're just gonna, I love this piece because it has that deckle cut. It's like, this is like the ribeye of pork chops. It's a pork chop with the bone in, that's the eye, that's the deckle. A lot of fat, a lot of marble, it's gonna taste great. What do we do? As always, salt, a generous amount. We'll hit the pepper mill with that in a minute. So we're gonna cook this pork because the theme is little restaurants. And these little places, what, what do I love about these places? If you've watched a show with any regularity over the past years, I really like to champion restaurants where there's a chef owner that's there, um, a guy or a girl in the kitchen, in the front of the house. It's their baby, it's their thing. They watch everything, they watch every step. There's that pride. I just think it makes a huge difference. And where better is that embodied than these little places? Like we saw Alex and, and, and her husband, Adar, who just, you know, they're in that kitchen all the time. She was nine months pregnant when we filmed that. Um, they're there all the time, they love to cook. Uh, same thing with the, the, the uh, business partners that run Little Giant, um, guys that have Cafe Caccia, same story. They're there all the time. They love what they do. They're in the restaurant, and they're often limited by space. We certainly saw that 
uh, in those three restaurants. Um, Little Giant's got no kitchen to speak of in Cafe Katja. They have a hot plate and a, you know, a light bulb. I don't know how they get the food out of there. That's wonderful. So I thought, let's just keep it simple. We saw that simple food. Let's, as I always do, let's make simple stuff. So it's still spring. Asparagus is in season. We got the pork just sauteed. Asparagus, we're going to blanch it. Real simple. Cook it in water. Let it cool. A little olive oil. I'm going to make these really neat mashed potatoes using Yukon Gold potatoes and just milk. Let me start with these because this is going to take the longest thing to cook. If you do this at home, you'll start with the potatoes because they're going to take a while. Yukon Gold. It's a potato that was invented in the 60s or 70s in Canada. It was, uh, uh, the, the, you know, the usual, by combining several other types of potatoes, they came up with this really good breed that's resistant to all sorts of blights and funguses, resistant to cold, tastes great. I think that Yukon Golds make great mashed potatoes. So this is a recipe I came up with when I was playing around with sort of how to make good low-fat things. We're just going to get this Yukon Gold, cut it into a medium dice, and we're going to cook it nice and slow in whole milk. Just enough milk to cover the potatoes. Real low flame. And it takes about 25 to 30 minutes till they're tender. Then the potato starch is released into the milk. There wasn't that much milk to begin with. We're just going to get the milk and the potatoes, put them in a little KitchenAid for a couple of seconds, twirl it, and you've got great mashed potatoes made with, you can use low if you want to use 2%, 1% milk, you can do that. Just finish it with something. Touch of olive oil, touch of butter, whatever. A little bit of something for flavor, and of course salt. But it's a super healthy way to make really delicious, creamy mashed potatoes. And the key is the potato starch is what's thickening it and giving it the mouthfeel, not fat. In go my taters. Could probably use a smaller pot, but I couldn't find one. And you'll see just enough milk now, just enough to cover them. Not even quite to cover them, because the milk's going to kind of rise up. That's probably plenty just like that. Pinch of salt, and let's get them on the fire. In the meantime, hot boiling water. I don't have a ton of water in there because you don't need a ton of water. I'm not going to waste a lot of energy. And how long does it take to cook asparagus? You know, depending on how thick they are, three minutes, two to three minutes, three to four minutes. How do I tell when I'm done? I'll pick them up with a tongue, and if they begin to just bend a little, you know, from their own weight, they're done. I don't want them, this isn't baby food. In the meantime, speaking of potatoes, let's keep an eye on these bad boys, because you can see we started with kind of a high-ish flame. You can see the sides beginning to bubble. Now I want to be careful, because milk has a real nasty tendency to form a skin and then overboil, and it goes all over your stove, and it's a real mess to clean. I keep a real close eye on it at this point, because once it starts to come to a simmer like this, I'm going to turn it down. And now we're just going to turn it down to a simmer and let it cook nice and slow. It's got a little saute pan here for a little pork chop. We're cooking for one this week. It's already salt and peppered. You saw that. And in she goes. Fits perfectly. I got lucky there. And again, when you put proteins in the pan, leave them alone. If you find at home, you're not getting good color on your, you know, sauteed items, put them in the pan and leave them alone. That's how you'll get good color. Yeah, see what I meant? The milk kind of foams up. Oh yeah, that skin formed. They're close. So I'd say when the pork chop's done, those potatoes are done. We're close. All right, it's been a couple of minutes. See, it, see, see how it released? It almost was like almost like a little band-aid. It was a little stuck, then it let go. I've got that nice color on the side. This side is concave. That's going to happen. You have this muscle here. That's how it reacts. But it seems going to be golden brown or done on both sides. You'll see it's going to be beautiful. All right, my pork chop's done. You can see there's a little blood coming out the top side. That means the juice is cooked all the way through one time. Turn it over, we've got really nice color because we didn't play with it. Yeah, you didn't think I was gonna get good color, did you? That's beautiful. So we're gonna hold that here by the stove, warm. Now, I'm gonna get my pota potatoes that are completely cooked in the milk. And we're gonna pass them through a food mill. Let's go with a pinch of salt. And you could do this through a little simple food mill like this. get to the bottom here. We're going to scoop like this. Can you grab that shot? Just scoop what's left here. Now we've got my beautiful potatoes. We're just going to add a little olive oil because remember there's no fat in this. All this is is milk and potatoes. So that's maybe a tablespoon of olive oil. Just whisk that in. Turn the pepper mill. We've already got salt in here, a little pinch, and I don't want to over salt anything. So we've got that going. 
just mix it. We don't have to use all of this on the plate, just some nice big dollop. If you wanted to, no one's gonna shoot you. Put a little butter on that. Butter and olive oil work beautifully together. We've got our asparagus that's warm. We had blanched. Push this off to the side. And again, we'll dress this with a little, just a touch of olive oil. Sometimes it's nice to put a little bit of vinegar here too, but we'll just use olive oil today. Gonna to turn to the pepper mill. And then our pork chop. Simple meal. My favorite cut of the pork is this back muscle here. You can see this little dark meat from that piece of deckle. I love that. Get a little mashed potato on that. Hmm. 20 minutes, a couple of pans. Simple and good. Get good ingredients, treat them simply. Great. And I love these little restaurants. You know, every season I'm going to keep featuring these. I mean, these places, by the way, these were little. I think my rule for this show is they had to have under 30 seats. Tiny, tiny, tiny. What are they, Chiquito? Have 18? Anyway, Chiquito, Little Giant, Cafe Caccia, all great restaurants, really inexpensive, chefs that care, that are cooking for you every night. And when you want to cook at home, it's simple, just straightforward. Don't play around. I love this potato recipe. Hope you do too. See you next week.